So, uh, welcome to the last track um, for today or for the OSMC right now. Um, next will be Ben Allers. He will tell us something about Linux monitoring and Windows logs with Greylog Collector. But before you start, I want to say that um, we meet at the hotel entrance at 18.30 for the guys who attend to the hackathon tomorrow. So, yeah, be there. We will go to lunch, uh, dinner afterwards. Yes, and now have fun. Hello, welcome. Um, I have a funny voice today, so I hope that works out. Um, it's not due to alcohol, by the way, so. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about um, monitoring Linux and Windows logs um, with the Greylog selector. Um, I slightly changed the title because of reasons which I explain later. Um, my name is Bernd. Um, I'm from Hamburg, in Germany, and I'm working for uh, Greylog as a developer. And um, yeah, let's get started. So, um, how many of you know Greylog? Keep your hands up if you uh, use it. Okay, cool. That's great. Um, for those who don't know it, um, I'm going to introduce it really quick. Um, Greylog is an open source log management platform. Um, with it, you can collect, index, and analyze structured and unstructured log data. Um, so you can uh, send all your syslog there, um, your application logs. Um, sometimes even some metrics or SNMP traps, something like that. Um, you can also uh, alert based on this log data. So when you, uh, you can define thresholds um, on certain metrics of logs or the number of logs that come in. And um, we have different uh, yeah, alert mechanisms, so we can send emails, um, HTTP requests, uh, post something into your chat room, something like that. And it's also quite extensible via custom plugins that you can write. Um, Greylog is written in Java, so um, you basically write Java plugins. Um, but that, with that, it's uh, quite extensible. Um, this is the, basically the main screen of Greylog. Um, at the top, you have a search bar, uh, some time selector um, that you can search for certain messages, like filter on sources, or just look for free text. And um, you get back a list of messages that match your query, um, a histogram of message counts over time. And um, yeah, you have uh, message fields. You see the messages here. It's a bit hard to see, I guess. It's quite small. Um, but that's basically the main screen of Greylock, where you operate most of the time. Um, we also have, um, we also support dashboards. So as you can see here, we have these kind of widgets and the top you probably cannot see it. We also have like how many messages matched your query. You can put those little widgets on dashboards. Um, this is for example, um, a test dashboard of solar activity that we somehow have in our Greylog instance, not sure why, but um, someone created that. Um, right. So. This is quite useful if you want to have um, dashboards on, on screens in your office or if you um, show that to other people that don't uh, necessarily have to um, search through the logs. Um, Greylog has this, has this notion of streams. That means you can categorize your messages that come in. So, for example, you can have a stream for login failures or you can have a um, stream for um, for special applications or something like that. So you can basically, basically can, um, all messages that come in, you can apply rules to, and then you can sort into different categories. This, this, that's, that's the streams, basically. Um, everything that you, um, all the configuration of Greylog can be done via the web interface. So you can create streams here. Um, you can edit the rules in the interface. Streams can also have outputs. So if you want, for example, if you want login failures uh, forwarded to another system, you can do that. And that's pretty easy. 
And you can also manage the alerts for the streams you have. So for example, if you have, um, like we have, sh we have chef events here as, ex as an example, if you have lots of uh, failed chef runs, um, you can alert on that and send an email or something different. You can also kind of manage all the nodes you have in your Gradle cluster. Uh, for each node, you get some basic uh, operational stats, like uh, memory usage of the JVM, current message rate that's uh, processed by the server, and you can also um, kind of stop message processing, view the, view the metrics of the server, and something like that. So if you have more than one server there, they will all show up here. Um, same goes for all the inputs. Um, when you want to send something to Greylog, you have to create an input, for example, syslog. Here we have three configured inputs. Um, we have GELF TCP, GELF HTTP, GELF UDP. We'll tell you later what GELF is. Um, but everything can be managed through the web interface. You can create new inputs here. Um, you can stop them, see metrics, all this kind of stuff. Um, we also support user accounts. That means um, you can, for example, connect uh, to your existing LDAP, and then you don't have to create all the user accounts on the Greylock server, but you can uh, reach out to LDAP for that. Um, and you can, we, can also, we also provide uh, a method to um, set permissions for certain users. So you can say, OK, this user is allowed to uh, search through this stream, or this user can see this dashboard. Um, Internally, we can even, uh, we can even um, set permissions for individual messages, but we don't expose that kind of detail to the web interface, so that's pretty flex flexible. But the main thing that you can do currently from the web, web interface is set permissions for streams and dashboards. Because this, uh, the first uh, screenshot I showed, the general search, is only available to admin users because they can search through all the log messages that are in Greylog. And when you um, give permissions to individual users, you do that on stream basis. So you can say, OK, user A can search through this stream. He can do everything in there, but he cannot see any other messages, any other messages that don't belong to that stream. And we also support, um, as I said, we support LDAP. We also support LDAP groups, so you can do role mappings, role or group mappings. So you don't have to create all of that yourself. This is a basic architecture, um, just really quick. You have data sources that send uh, log messages uh, via inputs into Greylog. Um, the server can process these messages, um, do the categorization like streams. Um, then it stores it into Elasticsearch. We're using that as, a, as, as our primary data store um, for full text indexing and filtering. Um, configuration is currently stored in MongoDB. It's not much, of not much data, it's just a few configuration stuff. We want to get rid of that uh, eventually, but yeah. Currently it's there. Um, the server can also, as said, um, send log messages to other systems via outputs. Um, for example, you want to send it to another Greylock server or something else that speaks syslog or gelf. Um, the server also has a REST API. And the web interface we have uh, communicates over the REST API with the server. So everything that's supported by the web interface can also be scripted with the REST API. And then we have, um, you can also connect other integrations um, via scripts that talk to the API, for example. Um, for all the extensions, we uh, created a marketplace, a few months or weeks ago. Um, that's a central place for plugins, content packs, GELF libraries, and other solutions. Uh, GELF, I will explain that later in a bit, in a bit more detail, but uh, GELF is basically the Greylock extended log format, which is a um, kind of log format we invented, structured log format. So we, ha we have libraries for that in the marketplace, so we can directly send messages to, G to a Greylock server from your applications. Um, plugins are basically inputs, so you can write special input plugins, you can write output plugins to forward to other systems. Um, you can write alarm callbacks to send alarms to different systems. And we also have content packs, 
which are basically pre-configured inputs, um, streams, and dashboards for certain software products. For example, we have an, we have an Nginx uh, content pack, so you just load that, install it, and then you basically get everything you need to co start collecting Nginx data, as an example. And we have lots of other stuff in there. Um, more about Greylock you can find on the internet, um, on our homepage, in the marketplace, documentation, and the source code is all, all the source code is on uh, GitHub and the Greylock 2 organization. So why are we writing logs in the first place? Um, first, getting insight into our applications, collecting business metrics, for example. Also for debugging problems, if you run into issues, your monitoring alerts you, something is wrong, you want to be able to dig in and find the cause for certain problems, what's going on in the system. That's why we write logs, for example. Um, you write logs to build an audit trail, for example. If you have some certain uh, requirements, security requirements, you can do that. That's why you write logs. And of course, you can do monitoring based on logs as well. So how do we access our logs most of the time? Um, the applications write to local log files. Some time ago we uh, SSH into machines and used basic Unix tools to analyze the stuff that's on there, search for problems, um, maybe extract metrics. And if you're lucky, you already have a central log management and don't have to SSH into machines and can use a central search and to look through all of that and analyze it. What kind of logs do we have? Um, I guess most of the data is syslog. Um, there are two standards. This is first the BSD syslog, which is um, in RFC 3164. Um, that's probably what most of you know. Um, it starts with the timestamp, um, the, the source of the, of the message, so the host, uh, the process name, the process ID, and then we have some kind of free text message. The problem here, for example, is the timestamp, because if you look at it, there's no year, and there's no time zone. Um, so it's kind of hard when you run your infrastructure in different time zones, or they are configured differently. Um, that's uh, not really nice. Um, the successor to the BSD syslog, which is in RFC 5424. Um, when you look at the timestamp, it's a bit better, actually. It has um, the year in it, and it also has the time zone in it. That's the Z at the end. It's an ISO 8601 uh, format. Um, we also have the source machine, the program, um, a PID. In this case, there's none. A unique message ID. And you also have some kind of structured data in there. So you see here, this is, uh, these are key value pairs, like event source, application, event ID, yada yada. And then you also have a uh, free text um, log message after that. Another example, Apache. Um, probably most of you know that. Again, um, the timestamp actually has a year and the uh, the time zone, but it's a kind of weird format, so you need some special path for that. Again, um, postfix, another example. Looks almost like syslog, same timestamp, host name, process, process ID. And then there's this transaction ID, and um, then you have some key value pairs, which actually looks like structured data already. Another example is squid. Same thing, lots of data in there. Doesn't look very structured. Uh, timestamp is a bit better, has a year but no time zone. Um, another example is log4j, for example. You can configure log4j to produce something better than this, but this is actually the example they show in their tutorial. So, and you actually see this in the wild, so this is kind of useless. There's no timestamp on it. And so, you, yeah, that's maybe something for the console, but it's nothing that you want to collect. And the last example is uh, the Ruby logger. Ruby has a standard uh, log library and the standard library, and also time, 
timestamp, no time zone again. They have this I, which is probably stands for info, which is also over here. And again, um, a plain uh, freeform text as a message. So as we saw, the number one problem is timestamps, actually. So either they um, miss the time zone or the year, and everyone likes to invent their own, their own um, timestamp. So how do we get value out of unstructured logs? So we can use regex, and more regex, and even more regex for that, which might look some, like something like this, which is um, a regex to extract, um, or to match a, an extractor IPv6 uh, address. Um, if you're lucky and use something like Logstash or Greylog, you can use Grog, which is an abstraction over regular expressions. You basically give names to regular expressions. I shorted that here. Or like this, you, have a, you say this is a username, then you provide the pattern for that. And then you can basically construct more combinations with the patterns you have. And you can also say, okay, this string should be extracted in, some, in, cer in a certain field. For, this is, for example, the Apache combined log, which, has, which uses the common Apache log pattern, and then adds the referrer and the agent, which is in the combined log. So if you have this, this is actually a bit better than pure regular expressions, but this can also get, uh, can become hard to manage if you have lots of them. And references, uh, dependencies, so that's, um, you might want to uh, use unit tests to actually test those. Um, Greylog, we also can use, as said, we can use grog patterns, um, but we also have um, a feature called extractors, where you um, provide uh, regular expressions, which is based on regular expressions, and extracts um, data from unstructured data into message fields. <coughs> Looks like this, also a bit small, I guess. Um, we have an example message. You can enter your regular expression that you want to use to extract data with the capture groups. Then you can hit try, and then you can even see if it matches. And then you can say, okay, this view, this number here, should be extracted into the view duration, duration field because that's the view duration of the, of, the home, of the website that has been displayed. And that's basically one way to extract data out of uh, unstructured messages. So how can we fix this? Um, first, the central log collection is good, so that you don't have to go to every machine and collect all the logs that, uh, that you produce. Um, if you have it in a central place, it's way nicer to um, search through it and analyze it. So you can use Greylog for that, or Elk, or there are other commercial open source products for that. And of course, um, one thing would be to use uh, structured log formats in the first place. So we don't have to um, go through all of our plain text data and extract it with regular expressions or grog patterns or something like that. So if your applications um, can emit structured log in the first place, you don't need that. You, don't, you save uh, resources because you, don't, because you don't have to process that much, and it's way easier to handle. Um, I, s I showed this already. This is a uh, structured syslog. So you can actually use this to send structured data, as I showed before. Um, you can instruct your application to write this kind of format. It's a bit... Yeah, not so nice, but works. Um, you might have seen CEF, the common event format, uh, just been invented by ArcSight slash HP. This format is uh, used uh, in certain network devices. You could also use that for your own uh, applications. It uses uh, syslog as a transport, so we have the timestamp problem again. Uh, but otherwise, it's kind of structured. You have the... Um, the CF version, the device vendor, the device uh, name, the device version, um, a unique message ID, a plain text message, um, the severity, and then you have key value pairs as structured data. As I mentioned before, uh, there's GELF, the Greylog extended log format. This is basically just 
JSON with some uh, conventions. So we have some required fields like the version, which is the GELF version, so it's not had nothing to do with the application. Then we have a timestamp, which is a, which is a um, Unix timestamp with uh, milliseconds after the decimal point. Um, you have a log source, example org for example, for example, and uh, you have a sh short message, which is, which is the actual log message. Then you have some um, optional fields like full mes message, where you, for example, where you can put uh, backtraces, so larger stuff, um, something like log level. And the most important thing is you can actually define custom fields there. You have to prefix them with the underscore, and then it will end up in the um, these fields will end up in your message. The, the underscore is removed uh, at the front. But it's, it's, it's kind of similar to the logstash JSON format. It has a bit some different uh, conventions. Um, not sure which one was there first, but it yeah. doesn't really matter. Or you can just use, also can just use JSON and send structured stuff. The important thing is that you have a timestamp and a message and some fields. Yes? Oh, sorry. Didn't see that. Um, in Greylock, you cannot currently. You can do that in Logstash, for example. They support arbitrary um, nesting of objects, like you can li have a list of objects and stuff like that. But in Greylock, we don't support that right now. Okay. So you can only do key value pairs right now. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So the question was if we can uh, do nested uh, JavaScript objects in JSON, basically. So yeah, I said you can also just use JSON if you don't want to use any of the existing ones. And that can also be parsed way easier than any uh, plain text stuff. So how we as Greylock try to improve the imp uh, ecosystem. For example, we contributed um, a GELF output for Isinga 2. That means you can configure Isinga 2 to send all internal events to Greylock and then can analyze them and look what happens. That's in Greylock, and uh, Isinga 2, I think, since 2.1 or 2.2, I'm not sure. Last year, OSMC, basically. Um, we also contributed a GELF logging driver to Docker. So this is in Docker since 1.8. That means you can start containers with a GELF driver as an output. They so introduced um, s several log drivers in 1.7, I think. So it basically sends um, structured data to Greylock automatically when you configure it. And it includes container ID, container image, and some other metadata about the containers as well. Uh, recently, we introduced uh, Apache modlog GELF, which is in beta right now. This is an Apache module that's the same thing. You can configure it to directly send all the access logs you get um, from Apache and error logs to Greylock in a structured format. So you automatically get um, the path, the HTTP verb, the return code, the bytes, the runtime. You get everything uh, automatically expanded into structured data. So you don't have to apply any extractors or stuff like that. Um, we also have a logging, uh, we have a log4j2 uh, GELF library. If you're into Java and use log4j2, you can use that to directly send GELF out of your applications. Um, there are several others too. Uh, like for Ruby and PHP and Python, it, but it, those are mostly maintained by the community. We also wrote a generic uh, GELF client, a Java library, so this can be used by other log appenders for logback or whatever to uh, avoid implementing all the GELF stuff over and over again. And the latest one is um, something for Runit. If you use Chef, you probably know Runit. It's a kind of a supervisor that starts takes care of processes, and that also has some kind of weird logging thing. And we wrote some small process that also takes these logs and uh, puts the output directly into Greylock. So yeah, we at Greylock love, really love structured logging, uh, structured data, and you should too, because it's way easier. Um, this is the second part of my presentation about the Greylock collector. 
um, the Grailog collector reads lo your local log files and ships them to Grailog. So if you have applications that cannot write to Grailog or Logstash directly, you can run this thing on your machine and it reads log files and ships them to Grailog. Simple as that. Uh, we also have Windows event log support, which is kind of limited for now. Um, I'll come to that later. Um, we support transport encryption via TLS. So the stuff is encrypted if you want. Um, we will also support um, certificate-based authentication in the future. And it runs on Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and AX as well, to some certain degree. Um, so why do we write another collector? So there are lots of others out there already. There's NXLog, which some of you probably know. This runs on Windows and on Linux as well. There's FluentD, there's Mozilla Heka, there's FileBeat, the new uh, log shipper from Elastic. And you can also use rsyslog or syslogng as a log shipper, basically, to read local log files and send them to Greylog. It also works. What we want is, and why we actually started this, is we want integration and centralized management of these collectors. Because with the others, for now, you can only, you, only, you have to basically configure that on every machine. You have to install it, you have to configure it in every machine, which kind of is okay when you use uh, config management, but we wanted to have it integrated uh, in Greylog and so that you can manage it, actually. That's the reason why we actually started this. Um, the current Greylog version, there's a uh, little bit of that already. You can see the existing collectors that are running and sending heartbeats to Greylog. Um, you, can see the, you can see the version, the collector ID, and which, on which OS it runs. And you can also just filter on, you can say, okay, just show me the log messages that came from this collector. That currently works. Um, there will be more in the future. Installation is pretty simple. We have operating system packages for Linux, uh, CentOS, Debian, Ubuntu, basically. Um, on Windows, you currently have to install it manually. Uh, we try to provide an MSI later that you can use to use scripted installs and make it a bit easier. And it also runs as a Windows service. So you can install it as a service and it starts up when you boot your Windows. So that's easier. That's the current uh, configuration of the collector. The main thing is you have to provide an URL to your Greylock server, to the API, so it can contact the Greylock server and um, send the heartbeat. And then we have uh, inputs and outputs. We have, set, we have currently we have two input types. We have files so to read from files, and we have a Windows event log, which can read from the event log. You can, have, you can provide the event the source of the uh, the event log source you want to read from. And outputs we currently have um, GAF output, so you can. You have to provide uh, the IP address of your Greylock server, the host name, and the port of the input. And then it just, that's all you need basically to send files or Windows event log to it. Um, the main idea is to get rid of everything below the server URL. So in the future, when we implemented the um, central management, the idea is that you just have to provide the server URL and maybe some access token or certificate. And everything else will be managed by Greylock then. Yeah, the current state of the collectors are a bit sad because um, changed priorities a bit and didn't work on that f for quite some time. So the Windows event log support needs update to support the new Windows APIs um, since Vista in 2008 because that changed and the library we were using is currently not supporting that, so that's a bit sad. Um, also, file reading needs, imp needs improvement to track state for example, and of course the central management, the reason why we're actually doing this, needs to be implemented. So that's why I actually uh, talked a bit more about structured logging than the collector and whole, because it's not in a nice state right now. Um, yeah, I think that was it already. Um, tomorrow there's the hackathon, and I will be there, so if you want, if you're interested in Greylock, or anything else uh, regarding logging, just contact me. I will be there. I will show you uh, Greylog if you want, or any other thing you have. And thank you for your time.
Are there any questions? In the back. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, how do you handle multi-line log formats? In the collector, you mean? Uh, no, uh, like from PHP, when you get a stack trace with multi-lines or Java or something else. Uh, we don't really do at the moment. Okay. So you basically have to send it the whole message currently. Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Any other questions? Is there a timeline when the Windows event API will be fixed? Not really yet, but we plan to work on that next year, the beginning of next year. <laughs> Some more questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.